from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Today is April 10th, 2008. I am here with pianist, composer, band leader, and living legend, Dave Brubeck. Dave, it's so nice to see you again. Thank you. I want to get at how a would-be rancher, cattleman, and cowboy becomes a world-famous jazz musician and composer. Tell us, uh, why don't we begin more or less at the beginning. I know your mother taught and played piano. Did she teach you? Yeah. And what did she teach you? What, uh, did she go through exercises or lessons or what? Mainly uh, harmonic progressions. And being that both of my older brothers were wonderfully trained, and I was the third son for some reason, she couldn't train me very well, mm. but she did her best. So I know you had a great love for the outdoors, and you really did think about becoming a rancher. Oh, yeah. When did you know you wanted to make music your life? Well, uh, I think um, that's what I love to do. And... Uh, it would have started when I was six or seven years old, even earlier. But uh, my father said to my mother, he's the last of the three sons, and I want him to follow me. You got the first two, and they're musicians, but he's mine, and he's going to be a cattleman. I see. Okay. So what kind of music was around the house? What were you hearing? The radio or records or people Radio playing? wasn't allowed. Really? Why not? If you want music, make your own. Interesting. <laughs> and yeah. uh, also, uh, there weren't many records, just a few opera records that old wind-up Victrolas. Do you remember any of those recordings? Or any favorites that you had? No, and we didn't spend much time with that. We were always occupied with something to do, mm -hmm. and usually uh, entertainment of any kind was uh, very scrutinized. Like, you didn't go to see a movie unless my mother was sure it was the right movie to see, and you didn't read the books that kids like to read unless she checked them first. But we had great books. Mm. Uh, yeah, so she just was going to be sure we were educated. Did she encourage you to play piano? Yeah, uh, on my own with what I was trying to do. I was always interested in improvisation from the time I can remember. Can you tell us how you learned to improvise? Is it just something that you do? I don't know. Uh, that started very early. Would you improvise on uh, pre-existing material or just make up things? Make up things and then play things by ear uh, that I heard her teaching to my brothers or to other piano students. Mm. But I was in no way uh, a good student. I was a good student if, if uh, if it's what I wanted to do, if it was what somebody else wanted me to do, forget it. So you always went your own way. Yeah. Yes. So as you're learning to improvise, what do you think makes good improvisation? Anyone can improvise, but what makes good improvisation? Uh, you're... 
your knowledge of the musical vocabulary and you you improvise on on uh, your knowledge up to a certain point and then you branch out into areas where you haven't uh, heard other people do that and you start doing your own thing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that your mother played and taught piano. What kind of music was she playing? She Empire loved Man? Bach and Chopin. Uh, Did you have that sheet music at, on the piano? Wouldn't have done any good. Really? <laughs> you could have it. <laughs> so I wasn't following it correctly. But uh, just hearing my brothers, it, it, the music was going on constantly. In our house, I have six children, and uh, it's like being in the conservatory. Mm. They're always practicing all over the house and getting together and playing, and uh, you're just surrounded with, with music. And so many of my friends, uh, especially in jazz, uh, have similar houses where there'll be whole families that play, like the Marcellus family. Look how many great musicians came out of that uh, because the father was such a great musician. Ellis. Ellis. and. Yeah. Uh, Bramford and went. But it helps to have a good ear. That is uh, that is the thing, yeah. I had a good ear. And uh, when I was small, I think my ear was better than now. Because hmm. I could hear everything pretty well immediately. I've lost some of that. Do you think we are born with a good ear, or is that developed? Some people have an oh, ear for music. Some people just are born with perfect pitch, can hear anything and know exactly what it is. And uh, others have relative pitch. If they hear one thing, they can relate it to something else, but they don't have perfect pitch. But your brothers were musicians. Yeah. You are a musician. I think four of your six children are musicians. Very good ones. I wonder if there's, maybe it's genetic. Maybe it is. Maybe it's passed you, on. You don't know because one of my best friends came from a family where no one was musical. They were almost anti-music. Hmm. And... Uh, his name is William O. Smith. When he's a composer, that's his name. When he's a jazz musician, it's Bill Smith. But somebody came to his grammar school selling musical instruments, or else he wouldn't have gotten a clarinet, where now he's a master of it. But he had no help from his family. Speaking of composers, I know you had a close relationship with Darius Mio, with whom you studied at Mills College. This is after World War II. Can you say or tell us which classes or what courses he taught and what you, what you learned from him? Uh, that's a big question. He, he taught counterpoint and... Uh, the rules that were basically Bach uh, approach to writing chorales and fugues, then you were completely free as a composer. And we were all different. It, doesn't, it wasn't like a lot of situations where you're all imitating the teacher. He, he didn't want that at all. 
wanting us to all go our own direction. Did he encourage your interests in polytonality or polyrhythms? He didn't have to. <laughs> I was interested. You were interested before Mio yeah. in these things. And it found out that he was the master of something that I was interested in, but this was the composer that had mastered it better than anybody. Are there any of his pieces that you particularly enjoy? Oh, yeah. Uh, do you know the Brazilian piano pieces? No, but I'm, I'm Suave intrigued. Suave de Brazil. I forget the exact title. Uh, but what do you like about that piece? He used Brazilian folk music. And he drilled into our heads, travel the world and keep your ears open and combine um, what you hear and remember that America's greatest music is jazz. So he knew that. Well, he was the first one to use jazz. Creation of the world yes. is the example. Uh, he, he's the first, they say, that used jazz. Uh, they called it a jazz ballet. And uh, was very interested in jazz. So w would you sit down and study his scores and talk to him about them? No, not that way. Uh -huh. I'd listen to him. he played things for us. Um, either at the piano or recordings. There were some wild re recordings of operas that he'd written. You know, he'd probably written more than any contemporary uh, composer up to the end of his life. Hmm. Uh, and so it covered a, a wide, vast, um, amount of music and approaches. He wrote for every instrument, any anything, whether you wouldn't think he'd write a concerto, say for a harmonica, but he probably did. Hmm. Okay, so he had a great influence on you, a great impact. Yeah. If he were sitting here with us, what would you say to him? Thank you. Yeah, because I, I was never a good student, but... Um, Why is that? Well, uh, I had trouble reading music um, because of my eyes when I was born. There were some problems of being cross-eyed and weak, getting things lined up. So I approached music through my ears more. And he knew I couldn't read music, and I was getting my master's degree under him. Didn't bother him at all. He, he would just say to me, you have to be a composer. It's too late for you to get a European background, but you're going to do it on your own. Hmm. We know that music is not about notes on a piece of paper. And it's not just about the mechanics of playing an instrument. Can you talk a little bit about what music really means to you? What is it about? What, is, what are you trying to do with music? Well, there's a tremendous amount that you try to do uh, to bring out the uh, human qualities of uh, what you have, what you want to uh, bring to the listeners, and uh, hopefully that what you want to say is uh, brought into their lives like it's been in yours. Mm -hmm. And you don't, if you have uh, 
a human experience that's similar to what what people in the audience are there's a connection and if you don't you try to make them come that direction by being sincerely what what you're trying to play or compose for yourself then it reaches out it also is a language but it transcends all of our individual languages so you can play all over the world and people hear it and feel it yes that's what Mio told me he said don't worry about not getting a, a real education typical of uh, the European students or the students from conservatories. You've got your own. And uh, that's very important is to be an individual. And he said, you know, the, this was in 1946, just after the war. Uh, the composers from the United States that are going to live are the ones that use the jazz idiom. And you've got the jazz idiom down. Don't ever give it up because that's the most important thing for an American composer. He said, starting with Charles Ives, who used jazz, Gershwin, who really used jazz, and uh, Bernstein, Aaron Copeland, and right today, over 50 years, 60 years later, those are the composers you hear the most. And he knew it then. Those are the ones that are going to say, this is American music. I think we can add Dave Brubeck to that oh. list. Don't you think? Well, Mio thought so. <laughs> he thought I was... He, he knew I couldn't read music. Hmm. Here I'm getting a master's degree. And it didn't bother him at all. He said, you'll do it. You're going to be a composer. Don't ever give up the jazz in him because you can really do that but bring it in to what you're writing. Speaking of writing, I want to ask you a little bit about your process, how you compose. And let's take a piece of yours. You've written so many wonderful compositions. But one of my favorites, and the favorite of so many musicians, is In Your Own Sweet Way. Oh, yes? yeah. It's been recorded by so many others. Seventy different jazz musicians have recorded it so far. But every week somebody else records That's right. it. The young kids are recording it. Can, can you tell us how that piece came together and what it is you were trying to do compositionally with that? One night after a concert, in those days I, I uh, had stopped playing my own compositions because we weren't able to really make a living doing things with the octet or compositions that I had written. So I figured I'll, I'll play popular songs of the day, start with the melody, and after you have an introduction to the audience through something they know, Last night was a great example of that, uh, hearing the indie musician. Uh, everything was great when he was playing Indian music, but when he really connected with the audience, uh, it was my funny Valentine. Because then, again, they had a tune and a harmonic progression that everybody there in the audience knew. And then you develop and start improvising. Im improvisation and composition are like this. One you write down, one you play and say goodbye, 
you'll never hear it or play it again unless somebody recorded it. But uh, I learned that if I'm going to feed my family, uh, I'll have a different approach, and that'll be to play standard tunes. So for a few years with my trio, uh, almost everything was a tune everybody would know. And one night, Paul Desmond, my great alto saxophonist, said we have to hire somebody to write some music for us, some original music. And I said, Paul, you must be kidding. I can write two tunes in a half hour. Why should I hire somebody to do it? He said, well, we're just playing tunes everybody knows we should be doing what, what, what is different. And I said, you're right. I'll show you what's different. So I started, because he had said that, I wrote In Your Own Sweet Way and another tune in a half hour. So are those songs based on pre-existing chord changes or are they totally new structures and, and forms? Uh, in Your Own Sweet Way has gone its own sweet way. Hmm. And uh, there, I wasn't aware at the time that anything was too different or anything. I was just writing what came into my head. And then Miles Davis heard it and said, Dave, I want to play that tune. Uh, would you write it out for me? So I wrote it out for Miles. So Miles's quartet played that tune before my quartet. Really? But I made a solo piano piece in my house. Uh, and in that solo piano recording, there were two standards, which is quite unbelievable for a solo piano. Well, one was called the Duke and the other your own sweet way. They're still played by jazz musicians a lot. What are your favorite versions of your songs played by others? I have heard some young players play this so great that I, I, I can't imagine that I wrote it and that they're improvising so wonderfully. Oh, people like Stan Getz recorded it twice, but I, I'm, I don't mean people accepted like Stan Getz. Bill Evans recorded it three times. Why all these great people love that tune, I'll never know. Are, yeah. are you serious? You don't know why it's I don't such know a great why. song? I know. And they argue about how the chord progression should go. There's one published version of it where uh, a very well-known jazz um, musician wrote a book uh, on harmony, and he puts it in a different key with my same melody and saying it's not in E-flat like Dave wrote it. It's in B-flat. Then there'll be big arguments about it. And then Miles used a different note in the last eight bars. So I'll know if I hear the young people playing it, whether they're Miles Davis fans or if they play the right note that I wrote, they're Brubeck fans. That's funny. So you know, it's a strange tune. But and strangely beautiful or beautifully strange. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. Oh, I, you get a lucky day now and then. <laughs> and it happened quickly, or is it something that you actually have to hone and revise? And oh, do you ever no? I, I had no idea uh, it just what I was going to do. Bow, yeah. Are you self-critical about your work? Absolutely. And what is it? Uh, how do you know, 
For example, when you're writing a work, how do you know when you're done? Well, you... I just finished a piece now, before I came here, maybe three or four days ago. And when I got to the final section, there are three themes in that piece. And I'm saying to myself, these three themes will go together and that will be the conclusion. And then you write, write it down, and it works. And uh, it started, the piece is uh, called Joy to the World, from, uh, they wanted some, you start now making Christmas music. Of course. And uh, they, they wanted this to be a very interesting album. I used a Gregorian chant that had the word joy in it uh, for one of the pieces because they want a joyful um, album with different composers. And if things all go through, it will be Yo-Yo Ma, uh, his, his recording. Uh, and my son Matthew's a cellist. A very good one. Yes, and he just had a meeting with Yo-Yo, and he said Yo-Yo was wonderful and wanted to know how Matthew did certain things. And yet Matthew said, can you imagine him asking me how to do it? with the master of everything on the cello? But he hadn't, he, he wanted to do something that Matthew did is to take the cello. Uh, I almost imagine him holding his cello like a guitar and playing four string chords. And Yo-Yo was, so I want to learn to do that. I've never done that. How do you? And so they didn't know each other in, in five minutes there saying, yeah, yeah, you know, let's do that. Well, you never stop learning, right? Oh, no. You're always doing something. Well, this is what intrigues me about you, is that you never stop trying to improve. Yeah. So can you tell me what it is you are working on to help improve? What is it? Uh, recently, I... I've written something that you could hear on, uh, it's out on a CD. We recorded it at um, Lincoln Center in Washington, in, in New York. New York. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a piece commissioned by the Jewish Congress for their worldwide convention maybe 30 years ago. And there is an organization that is putting out all the music written with a Jewish theme. And it, it's uh, going to be hundreds of composers on that project. And uh, I used uh, the, the Jewish theme they wanted with black African-American themes, because at the time there were all the riots in uh, Watts in Detroit, Washington, right here. And they said, we want some music that will show the similarities between these 
two peoples, cultures, that aren't getting along right now and show that they both were enslaved, they both were scattered throughout the world, they've been minorities wherever they've been. But I want you to write a piece that will show how similar they are and that we should have peace together. So I use Martin Luther King. Uh, we must live together as brothers or die together as fools. Well, that's true today. Unless we straighten out, we're going to go the way of the fools. Mm. And to bring people to the knowledge that we're all one. So that, that piece came out and they said, would you write something else to make it the length of the CD? Well, during World War II in the Battle of the Bulge, and I saw all the horrible things. You were there. I was there, yeah. Were you working with the Wolfpack Band? Or was that, were you still a soldier? We were a soldier, but we were bandsmen. I see. Almost all my guys had been injured. Uh, we were one of the few bands that could wear their Purple Hearts. I'd say when you're playing at the front line, uh, wear those Purple Hearts so those guys that are going into battle will know you've been there because they're a tough audience to get it, them to react or anything. Their mind is on, am I going to be alive tomorrow? Was that on your mind? Sure. Do you remember no, the feeling of being not? on the front lines? I was behind the German line that day and damn lucky to get back. How old were you then? 23, I think. I think. Yeah, 24 at the most. And I wanted to write the Ten Commandments in my mind. Seeing all, uh, you know, we almost lost World War II at that period. And it wasn't good. And uh, it was a time of great struggle for many people. Yeah. So I'm curious, everybody struggles with something. What gets you through your struggles? What I was going to say is I decided then that someday I'm going to write a sacred piece on the Ten Commandments. Good. And uh, I just finished that piece maybe a year and a half ago. It took that long. You ask, how do you do something? Sometimes you do it so quick, it's like nothing. And sometimes you'll do something because I started thinking about our troops in Iraq, what they're going through, and what the Muslim world is going through. So I said to the person that is going to make this CD, I know that you know a lot about the Muslim religion. Can you tell me, is there any time where they speak about the Ten Commandments? And he said, well, I'll search through it. And after he looked through two or three books, he called me and he said, Dave, I think I found what you want. Well, what is it? I found that there is in writing that we, meaning 
the Quran or the Muslims must follow the laws of Moses. The laws of Moses are the Ten Commandments, only there's over 600 commandments, I've been told. So here I do something that's from 1944, I do maybe last year, and it's the Ten Commandments. It's being recorded now by the Pacific Mozart Chorale in Berkeley, California. So th some things take that long. Uh, but out of feeling for the guys in Iraq and even the Muslims, why are you doing this? The same thing I felt at the Battle of the Bulge. Why are we murdering each other? 60 million people died do you know that? World War II, 60 million. Why do you think we do that? Because, and this is what I wanted to prove in my writing, we really don't know our own religions. Very few of us are really aware so in my first big religious piece, it's 71 minutes long, recorded by the Cincinnati Symphony. The heart of that piece is the one thing that they think Christ said that wasn't really pushed in the Old Testament. Everything else you, you could find in the Old Testament. Love your enemies do good to those that hate you. Now this is the core of what Christ was trying to tell us or the world. That the only answer is to love your enemy. He doesn't say you don't have enemies. Go the next step if you want to survive. What did Buddha say? The crowning enlightenment is to love your enemy. So you don't have to step out of your own religion. You can find it in all of the, or most of the great religions of the world, is that we're not in the core of our own religions. And I've written piece after piece trying to get people to really examine what they are. How, how can you go to war when the greatest thing that your religion teaches is love your enemy? You see, there's the answer. Nothing else is going to work is when you can realize what Christ is trying to teach us, what Buddha is trying to teach us. And we have to spend not billions and millions on war, but on education and bringing together the people of the world to examine themselves. Then if you don't believe in religion, become a good scientist and know that we came, all of us, from the same beginning of life. We're all brothers after all. So can you say that you are trying to uh, share this message through your music? Oh, yeah. It's a, your, in your music is a conscious attempt to uh, spread this message. In my sacred music, in in uh, in jazz, it's it sometimes happens, and it sometimes uh, after the war, I was getting the war out of my system by playing really violent music for a while. Really, Paul Desmond said I was 
a wild man. The wildest he ever heard me was right after the war. What does wild mean in this context? Uh, Warlike. <laughs> At the piano? As, yeah. As a player? As a player, yeah. Getting very dissonant and uh, expressing anger. You see, there's strong drives, anger and love. And we fight that every day in some way or another. Love has to win or we all lose. That's what I try to bring out. And uh, there's wonderful things in Christianity about love. Uh, the greatest of these three things is love. And, uh, so speaking of spreading this message, I know that you had, you achieved great fame, especially in the 1950s. You're on the cover of Time magazine. You create uh, a, a huge selling record, Time Out. Um, you were among the high profile musicians. And during that same period, you're touring with an integrated group throughout a country that has problems with integration. So how do you reconcile an America which um, signifies or symbolizes freedom and democracy with the intolerance that you experienced with an integrated group, especially in the South and, and other places? How did you balance those things? Was your was your integrated group, and this is the quartet with Eugene Wright playing bass, was this a conscious attempt to literally to spread love or are you just trying to create the best music you can? Depends on the night <laughs> and depends on what part of the night. Uh, yeah. you, you can't go in with any fixed ideas. You just start remembering something when you're playing your best, it's when you're totally concentrated on the, the moment. And you can't rehearse that. Either happens or it doesn't. But you did experience some grief in some parts of this country. Oh, terrible. Yeah, sure. But you fight against what you know is holding your country that you love from really developing. Uh, and do you fight with love? How do you, you, how do you, you fight this? Uh, uh, with anger or love. Mm -hmm. Love is the strongest. And um, you, you have to reach through the anger of your culture to get to the love some way. And uh, that's, that's what I have tried to do. And then I don't think what I've done reaches hardly anyone. But um, if you listen to the real ambassadors and you hear Louis Armstrong uh, with tears in his eyes after what happened in Little Rock, after he sent a, made a remark about President Eisenhower should go to Little Rock and lead those children by the hand. You see, as much as I, uh, I admire President Eisenhower, it would have been great if he'd done that. Gone down there and saying, enough of this. In, in my life, my heroes have often, well, they've been all kinds of heroes. From Beethoven, for, for example? Uh, Duke Ellington, 
uh, Louis Armstrong, one of the greatest men you could know. Uh, By the way, we know Louis Armstrong as an amazing trumpet player and a vocalist, wonderful vocalist, and an entertainer. But you knew him personally. You yeah. were friends. Yeah. What should we know about Louis Armstrong that the general public doesn't know? That he could rise above all the unfairness in his life and go out there and bring us together in love because he refused to let hatred uh, bury us. When people would say uh, to him, uh, uh, jazz uh, has to be played by African Americans, he'd say, Jack Teagarden, who was a white trombonist, Jack is my brother. Now, he's making a big statement. He's uh, the most loved American. He's trying to tell us. And who listened? Mm -hmm. who, who listened to him? When people said, can, can they, uh, blacks and white work together? He said, cats of any color. He said it. Who heard him? I heard him. Uh, I grew up loving the whole jazz idiom. I worked with the, the people that w were, since I was a kid, I, I, at 19 I worked with one of the greatest black women pianists, Cleo Brown. I played intermission for her. So I was fortunate. Uh, I grew up in black clubs. When I wanted to see if the girl I wanted to marry, we have been married 65 years, uh, was going to be able to accept my life, I brought her to a black club and said, this is going to be the life I love. And I want you to, to, to see what it's like in a black club. So some of the black musicians saw me and said, Dave, come up and play. So I left my wife alone in this club and went up on the bandstand and played. And a, a, there were four in a family right in the next table next to my wife. And they leaned over and tapped on the table and said, that boy's got black blood in him. And that was the greatest compliment and the way that she would have to adjust. And boy, she, she adjusted in, in uh, what she's written. Well, let me ask you a little bit about your wife, Iola. Specifically, what role does he, she play in your musical life? A well, great one, because what we, we could see what had to be changed for our country to be successful, to really be what we are supposed to be. Is it's really love of everybody. And we lived through a lot of things where that love was trying to be destroyed. Uh, you do what you can. I integrated the U.S. Army. Do you know that? I do not know that. Yeah. With your band? Or? With my band. One of the guys that had come back from the front line was a black musician. Do you remember his name? Jonathan Richard Flowers from Boston. And another one was Gil White. And I put them into the band. And 
the leader of our unit was Colonel Brown. And he had saved my life. He heard me play. He said, I don't want that boy to go to the front. I was on the next day I would have been probably wiped out. Never put him in the line. Mm. When I brought the, the black musicians, he said, great. Uh, then they made a general out of him, and he had to leave. So he came up. Uh, all the, uh, the officers were saying goodbye to him at a party, and he asked the band to play. And he came up on stage and shook hands with all of us. And when he got to Jonathan Richard Flowers, he put his arms around him. That was a signal to his officers, don't you touch this situation. This is what I want. Then he went on to feed the Germans because of his knowledge from World War I he, he fed the Germans when they were starving. He could speak German. And uh, he knew how to get food. Getting food to starving people is a lot more than just saying we need food. You've got to get it there. Sure, it's logistics. Logistics, and yeah. he knew. So they took him away from us. Mm. <laughs> and I... But he sounds like a courageous man. He was courageous. Yeah. And, uh, but, but if you don't mind, I want to return to Iola. Yeah. And again, the role she has played in your music and your musical life. Well, thank goodness we think alike most of the time. On our first date, we talked for three hours. Mm. And I proposed that we get married. On the first date? Yeah. Wow. And she accepted because it was the first time I'd had a real conversation with a girl. She was 19, and I knew she understands me, and I understand her. She was musically inclined? I know she's a lyricist. She was in acting. She was an actress. And uh, speech. And she worked in radio? Yeah. Yeah. The first time we did really work together but didn't know each other was in radio on campus. So how about your collaborations? I know she, for example, wrote the lyrics on most, if not all, the songs in The Real Ambassadors. She worked with you on the Cannery Suite for in most recent years. How, what's the process of your working together, of collaborating? Does she give you a set of lyrics that you set to music, or is it the other way around? Sometimes, uh, one of my favorite ones, is she wrote to me in a letter, uh, and when I read the letter, I knew I had to set that to music, and Carmen McRae has sung it wonderfully. Uh, you know the singer Deedles? Yeah, Diane Shore. Diane Shore has sung it with the Count Basie band and uh, with uh, another band. And recently I showed it to Wilfred Brimley, and he's going to sing it. I've never heard him sing. Oh, he sings great. He's got a great voice. Oh, yeah. 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 But when he saw the words, he said, oh, I got it. See, there, I said that these words came in a letter. I've traveled across the country. I've sung with lots of bands. I play in all those cities that book those one-night stands. I'm lonely and is weary. I know the scene so well, but the blues have come to get me and to drag me down to hell. But I keep traveling. 
trying to unravel the blues. I keep traveling, traveling with the blues. And that goes on and on with, if you've been a musician and on the road, or if you've been like Wolford, who's been on the road in various ways, I wake up every morning. Let's see, I look into I wake up every morning and wonder where I'm at. I look into a mirror and ask myself, who's that? <laughs> I left a, behind a good man whose name I can't recall. But I, if I, I, I love that old man or no man's been loved at all, but I keep traveling. So my wife wrote, wrote all this to me and I knew I had a blues. Boy, is it a blues. And wait till you hear it with, with Deedles and Carmen McRae. It's a wonderful song. Yeah, and then there's all kinds of songs that relate to the Bible. I think we've got 10 oratorios, some, one that I love is Chief Seattle's speech where he says the president in Washington has told me that we must sell our land. How can you sell the sky or the land? But if I sell you our land, will you remember what we have taught our children to respect the air? to respect the streams, the trees, the fish, all the wonderful creatures on this earth. And the president in Washington agreed and they isolated him on the island off the coast of Seattle and didn't keep one promise. You were one of the world's great and most famous not just jazz musicians, but musicians and composers. Tell me, is recognition important to you? Well, uh, it would be nice, but it, it, it's, the main thing is to get it down on paper. Then the next step that somebody will record it and that people won't just leave it buried someplace in my house. I've just done a piece that hadn't been done for 17 years, but we did it at Notre Dame because it's in praise of Mary. Mm. 17 years is a long time, and I expected never to hear it again. I've got a lot of stuff like that that I don't expect to hear it again, but I've written it. If it's just for me, if it's just for my children. No, each generation will be able to discover. I hope so, but recently the Pacific Mozart Chorale, as we speak, is making a CD of my sacred services. Mm -hmm. And they... Uh, they're doing one that's thrown in that's not sacred, but it starts. Are you now or have you ever been a Democrat or a Republican? And then it gets deep. <laughs> Dave Brubeck, it's, it's a great pleasure to talk with you as always. Um, I thank you not only for today, but for your lifetime of music. I hope we get a chance to continue this conversation. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.